In this screencast, I'll be showing you how collect to site thresholds, which are new in Event Century version 3.4, work. Please keep in mind that the collector will have to be enabled in order for this feature to work. Now, collector or server side thresholds don't sound very exciting, but what that feature lets you do is detect lateral movement or lateral spread on your network. Often, when an attacker gains foothold on your network, whether that be uh, malware or an actual human intruder, uh, they'll try to spread on your network in order to access valuable information, very often resulting in similar events being logged on multiple machines uh, within a certain time period. In this screencast, I'll be taking a simple approach, and what we're going to do is we're going to detect uh, the same process being launched on multiple machines. The simplest example would be somebody running a PSXAC or a similar type of software against a number of machines within a certain time period. At the end of the screencast, uh, I'll be also going into some of the caveats of the lateral detection when it comes to more sophisticated methods, uh, such as unique service names, for example, and how we can uh, work around that and detect those as well. But now let's uh, take a look at the server-side thresholds. When you install Event Sentry 3.4, it has the threat detection package already included. If you've upgraded from a previous version, you'll have to download that package uh, from our server, and you can do that by clicking on the Packages icon here and clicking on Download. The threat detection package is not assigned by default, so you'll have to assign it by either making it global or assigning it to one or more hosts or groups. The filter that I'm going to take a look at here is the malware spreading filter. This filter is a little different than what you get in the default package in that I excluded a number of processes here already that uh, are commonly launched on servers. I've taken the liberty to exclude the number of processes that I've observed on my test network here to be launched uh, frequently and creating false alerts. But let's take a look at how this works. So the objective here is that we want to detect if a process happens within a certain time period, if the same process happens within a specific time period on a number of computers. And we have full control over all the aspects of this detection of this threshold. Anything we do has to be based on events. And in this case, we're looking at the 4688 event that's logged by Windows when a new process is started. So any sort of detection of lateral movement that we want to set up will have to originate from an event. So that could be a log on event. That could be an event that's logged by Event Sentry, for example, when a service is created. Say we want to get an alert if services are suddenly created on more than five hosts within a minute, for example. So this is how everything starts. So you'll start with a filter that essentially specifies what is the event that's being logged as a result of the malicious or potentially malicious action. So in this case, it's the 4688 event. So we'll start there. So this filter will look at all new processes being launched with the exception of the processes listed below. So now let's take a look at the threshold here. The first thing we'll do is we'll have to enable the threshold, and it has to be a collector side threshold because only collector will know if something happens on more than one computer at the same time. We'll want to know if more than five computers are affected by this event within 30 seconds. And how we set this up is something I'm going to explain now. I purposely disabled all the event processing checkboxes here because I don't want to actually see the 4688 events. I can always review those in the web reports later on. I just want to know when they happen. And I've checked both boxes here. I want to know when the threshold is first reached, tripped, and also want to know when the 30 seconds expire. In many cases, you can clear that second checkbox. It's more or less optional. But the, the one that you definitely want to have is the log when the threshold is met. The next thing we want to define is which part of the event serves as a unique identifier. So in our case, the process name is the unique identifier because we want to know if the same process is being launched on remote hosts. If we're looking at logon events, for example, then the unique identifier would probably be the username. If we wanted to detect software being installed or services being created on multiple machines, then we'd want to look at the service name. So that's the next step. So once you've identified the actual event that's being launched, the next thing you want to configure is what's the unique identifier. 
So here we're using an insertion string as the identifier. Insertion string number six. Insertion string number six points to the process name. To review the insertion strings of an event, you can do two things. You can go back to the general tab, click on the lookup button here, and that's usually the quickest way. You can review the event template here. You will see here that the new process name here is percent six, and in event entry we call that insertion string number six. You can also access those in the tools menu under utilities event message browser and you can navigate there that way as well. But let's go back to our malware spreading filter. So now we've identified, we've said, let's take a look at those 4688 events and any process name is going to be our unique identifier. So you can think of it this way, every unique identifier that we select here or a combination of thereof will create a bucket. So if somebody launches Notepad on this computer, Event Century will create a virtual bucket called notepad.exe. In fact, it will contain the full path. So something like C, Windows, System32, notepad.exe. Normally, for an agent site threshold, the threshold counter will start will be applied to that bucket, meaning that every time somebody launches Notepad, that a counter will be increased. But for collective site thresholds, where we're grouping, and this is what we're doing here, okay, it works differently. Because instead of counting how many times the same process is being launched, which we don't care about, so we don't care if PSExec is started three or four or five times on the same computer. What we care about is if PSExec is started on multiple computers at the same time. And this is where the group by feature comes in. We're going to group it by the computer because that's because we want the unique computers to be the actual counter for this threshold. So for every bucket that Event Sentry creates, so let's say PSExec and Notepad for example, every unique computer counts as one. So let's take a look at our computers here. So we have test servers here. We have five test servers here. So if I start Notepad or PSExec here on sender 10, a bucket is created here on this collector machine with the name of PSExec and sender 10 counts as one. If the same process starts on sender 11, the counter gets increased to two and so forth. So if all of these computers launch PSExec, the counter, the threshold counter, will be 5. If only sender 10 launches PSExec 5 times, the counter will only be 1 if we use the group by feature that we have defined here. So let's go and take a look and see this in action. What I've done here is I've set up a threshold notification to a pop-up and network pop-up here on this machine. Uh, in most cases that's not what you'll want to do. Um, but just for the purpose of illustrating this in real time, I've created this action here. So what I'm doing here is the event that's going to be logged by the collector is going to be 1211. So anytime we're encountering this, we're going to send it to a desktop notification that's going to pop up big time on the screen here. I'm going to minimize the management console. I'm going to minimize this report here as well. So we're going to use the Event Sentry Admin Assistant to launch processes on remote hosts. Uh, it works very similar to PSExec, except that it's wrapped into a GUI and it allows us to essentially apply an action to multiple hosts with just a few clicks. It integrates with Active Directory and Event Sentry, so we can see the same groups here that we see in the Management Console. So I'm going to expand those here. And this is a free download um, on eventcentry.com. You can just go to the download section along with the Event Century sysadmin tools. There's a number of things you can do. You can copy files, query file sizes, versions, control services, reboot computers, all but just a few clicks. Uh, so it's a pretty handy tool uh, if you're managing more than a handful of hosts. So what we're going to do is we're going to start the ipconfig.exe command. Nothing malicious, but just for the purpose of illustration here, and we're going to launch it against all the 
computers of those two groups and see if our threshold filter will detect it. So let's click Start. And there we go. So here it ran. And here's the first alert. This first alert actually is about the service executable that the Event Sentry Admin Assistant uses in the background. So it's kind of like the PSX service. Um, so the Admin Assistant creates a service, starts the service, and that service actually runs the IP config command then or whatever other command you select. It says that the limit of a threshold object has been reached, so that's 5 in 30 seconds, um, also shown here. We see here that it's grouped by computer. It was detected after 2 seconds. Um, remember the timeout period was 30 seconds, so there's 28 seconds remaining. It shows us which computers it was detected, so it's a little out of order, but that's just you know how the timing worked in this case. So we have uh, sender 1, 2, 4, 10, and 14. And here's some details about the actual events as well were, that were encountered. So let's take a look at the web reports to see what else has been logged. So we have a filter um, set up here that looks for these collector events. I'm going to hit search here. And what we'll see here is that we have two events actually being logged. So let's take a look at those. The first one is what we saw earlier about the remote execution service that was created. And the second one is actually from my pconfig. I didn't get that as a pop-up because I had a threshold assigned to the actual action, which is something you can do in events entry to ensure you're not getting bombarded. Uh, with a notification, but of course it's always logged in the database. So here we can see that the IP config was detected as well. But we have more information, so I'm going to remove the exclusion where it limits it to the 1220 event. And we'll see that they have a couple more here. And here's the event that's being logged when the threshold expires. And that gives us a little bit more information. So after the 30 seconds are complete, it gives us the actual count. So remember, the first alert was just about 5 because that's when the threshold was triggered. But now after the 30 seconds, it gives us the full information, shows us all the hosts, where the process was started. So in this case, we're still uh, talking about the first one, which is the service. It just shows us what the limit was and what the actual count was. So that's pretty useful, and the same goes for IP config, of course. So all the all the hosts here are listed. Yeah, this is a little annoying, so you can do this here and um, see the event in more detail as well. So what you then do with these events is, of course, up to you. You can uh, forward them by email, which is common. You can send them to a ticket system. So there's a number of things you can do, or you can take corrective action on the collector and issue a process, for example, or some command. But that's all there's to it. So you can always use these events that we have here as templates. We have other ones here as well, for example, RDP logons. So here is a similar thing. So here we're looking for 4624 events, which are logged when somebody logs in uh, to a host. We're excluding certain uh, strings in the event that it shouldn't match to avoid false alerts. Insertion string number nine is a logon is the logon type, where 10 is a remote desktop. Remember we said in here the limit is a little different here. We got four and five minutes. Again, all this can be adjusted. The insertion string here is different five, which represents the username. But again, we're grouping it by computer. So we want to detect if an RDP session for the same user account happens on more than four computers at the same time. But again, you can change this, so you can go back here and say, okay, you know, I want to remove that restriction of logon type 10 and or switch it to logon type 3, which is a network logon, and detect if a user logs on to more than X computers in a certain amount of time. You can also detect if people are reusing a user account to do a physical logon to a workstation, in which case you would change this to the number two. So then you could detect and you can increase the time interval, let's say to four hours or eight hours of a workday. And then you'd be able to detect if the same user account logs on to multiple different machines. So this, this, this feature is very open-ended and really lets you apply it to just about any scenario you'd like. And as you saw with the 
pop-up there, uh, the alert comes in right away. I mean, there's a very short delay between the action taking place and events actually notifying you. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning of the screencast, actual malware or intruders are going to try to operate in a stealth-like fashion and hide and try to avoid patterns as much as they can. So, for example, um, if they really try to launch processes, for example, or use something like PSXact, they'll probably try to avoid using the same service name on all the computers, which makes this a little bit more difficult to detect. But this is where the versatility of Events Entry can really help you, because with Events Entry, you can not just detect or operate based on events, but you can create your own events and you can utilize Events Entry's service monitoring, for example, because when a service is detected in Event Sentry, then Event Sentry will also log an event to the event log, and you can in turn then use that event to trigger the threshold. So instead of using the 4668 event, I'm sorry, 4688 event, you can use Event Sentry's event. So I've opened up a tab here which shows the service history, you can see here that the Auto Administrator Remote Execution Service, uh, the Event Center Admin Assistant, used to be called Auto Administrator, so this name. But if we take a look at this here, we'll see that Event Center detected the service being added on all these computers here. So Event Center will detect um, if a service or driver is added, and you can then act on that event instead. So if we take a look here and go to the event log, We'll filter down to Events Entry. Then we can see here that Events Entry detected a lot of service activity, and one of them was, for example, on Sender 2, and that's going to be applicable on a few other ones as well, is that a service was added. And let's take a look at this event here. So Events Entry detected that a service was added. Here is a name. So we could use that as the unique identifier. But we wouldn't even have to do that. Services are usually not added on a regular basis, especially not on multiple hosts at the same time. So we could just simply say, OK, so let's just say any time this event is being logged on more than five computers within one minute, that's when we want to kick off our threshold alert. So there's a lot of options uh, we have, and you can expand this to file monitoring when a file is dropped into a particular directory. So since Event Sentry does more than just log monitoring, but, but can actually detect activity on a system like uh, services or files, you have a lot of versatility here to detect threats. I hope this was useful and showed you how you can use Event Sentry to detect network security intrusions on your network in real time. Thank you for watching.